Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 647. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 19th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday show, kind of the free-for-all, because there's not a lot of topics on my list. I have maybe one topic and some side topics we'll talk about before we get too far into the program. Please like this program on YouTube and Facebook. Share it with your friends and foes. You have some foes that would love to watch us talk about Pantaki. I can't even speak. Uh, talk, talk about the church. And... If you've not subscribed, and many of you have, now's a great opportunity to subscribe to the channel. George, how are you doing this week? Just fine. I, Kevin, I come before you a shamed man. I did my Ashes first to go. For, I'm not going to call it ashes to go. I still have some self-respect. But we would had an online Ash Wednesday service, the Liturgy of Penitence. And, and then at uh, noon and at 5.30, we had drive up ashes and communion. And I and my uh, deacons uh, were out there with uh, these six-inch uh, cotton swabs or Q-tips, the wooden ones, with mm -hmm. the, and just stick it in the ash, do it on your forehead, bop it in the can, and uh, uh, people enjoyed it. But yeah, I was it, just it, feeling it, like I said, "Thank God nobody's filming me," yeah, except right. for my wife, who posted a picture on uh, Facebook of me. I so got my to see shame some pictures. No well, I mean it. it it we're drawn to these times to make uh some sacrifices i say that because i'm i'm now in a tin can in the middle of florida and i don't know if the people can hear the the microphone may be taking out the noise but there's a little bit of rain going on in the background and you know this is something that COVID has brought on an opportunity to travel for you as a priest you have had to drastically change how you operate church and how you operate worship and how you work with your community of believers uh, and it's amazing to see it's been a year i think the church those who have survived have finally figured out how to survive in COVID times there's always good news at the end of the tunnel hey maybe by june we'll have herd immunity maybe by september i heard somebody say maybe by next easter uh, in 2022 i don't know but i do well, know that the church is surviving well, it's fascinating to see how people respond. We're having a video of Stations of the Cross today online, and um, I'm putting it together, actually going to finish it when we're done broadcasting. And it's interesting because we have people recording their Stations of the Cross. We have lay people each do one of the 14 stations. And we have some people in their 80s and 90s who have just jumped in enthusiastically into Zoom and video conferencing and putting up their iPhone on a little stand and, re and reading or a, a lesson or something. And then we have other people who are our age who, you know, if it doesn't have a remote control switcher, they're not turning the thing on. <laughs> so it's quite fascinating to see how people adapt to these times. My... <sighs> older than 60 year old mother I, if i if i said her age i think she would be offended um is miss zoom at the, at her uh retirement community and uh, so she's taking her zoom meetings at two or three a day because she's still on boards of uh some of these uh places she's worked for before and i get these notices all the time because i'm the, I'm the backup to her email if she ever gets locked out i get a notification Patricia Carlson has accepted another Zoom invitation. Oh, great. Here, <laughs> It's just like she needs to keep her brain active. And uh, I think if you have any adaption to technology, regardless of age, uh, COVID is an opportunity to, to learn something new, not just, uh, you know, put yourself in isolation. Mm -hmm. However, as a church, we need to be able to reach those who uh, are not able to communicate because they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, in their homes. And they're not in the malls. They're not walking around. They're not visiting. They don't have people visiting them. And we want to be sure that we have extra uh, prayer and uh, identification of shut-ins. It's, it's a different time now for shut-ins. So well, I think we got that message out. 
<laughs> uh, lots of things happening in the news. The breaking story yesterday was the uh, Supreme Court has decided uh, to bring to conference, if I can bring the story up here, um, some of the, uh, the court cases dealing with the Episcopal Church uh, in Fort Worth, uh, All Saints, and others, whether or not the Supreme Court thinks that um, Jones v. Woof is the law of the land, or Watson v. Jones is the law of the land. One was in 1872, which, uh, and one was in 1979. Basically, the courts have been uh, ruling towards Jones v. Woof. I'm going to be talking with A.S. Haley about this because this is all technical stuff uh, if the petition goes forward after Monday. I suspect it won't. Um, this may be just a one or two day story, um, but this is kind of the last gasp of the Episcopal Church. Who, they've lost in South Carolina, they lost in Texas, um, they won in California. So we'll have to see what happens here. I'll keep you posted. If you see a video with A.S. Haley, we're going to talk all about Supreme Court dockets and the process because it's not easy to get into in. Uh, uh, have a victory in the Supreme Court, although Alan Haley is a victor of the Supreme Court. He won his case there. So. Well, for, for those who don't understand how the American legal system works, the United States Supreme Court chooses which case it hears. Uh, not all appeal. It doesn't have to accept appeals. Mm -hmm. And they have conferences where the judges meet maybe six times a year and go through a series of cases that have been presented to them. And they have 489 cases to go through today at their conference, and it's secret. Nobody's there except the judges, no clerks, no, no secretaries. And the, the vast majority, they reject, no, we're not going to hear this issue. And there are three ways forward. They either accept the case and set it for hearing, they reject the case, or they relist the case, meaning they kick the can down the road. The significance of this is that the Episcopal Church cases were heard on January 22nd, and the court has relisted the two Episcopal Church cases, All Saints versus the Diocese of Fort Worth, and the National Episcopal Church versus the Diocese of Fort Worth, along with a Presbyterian case from Washington State. And what's significant, I think, from my lay perspective, is that they've got three cases, two of which follow the uh, 79 case which says you can have neutral principles of law in church property issues meaning you look at what the deed says not what the denomination says mm -hmm. Texas followed what the deed says Washington State followed what the denomination says saying it doesn't matter Presbyterian Church is not on the deed of the Seattle Church if the Seattle Presbytery says it's theirs it's theirs so they may be finally going to resolve this because it's unusual to relist. Uh, according to the SCOTUS blog, uh, it says that since 2015, the Supreme Court has only heard cases that they've relisted at least once. So this may be a marker that it may take off. And if so, you're going to have Alan Haley on a lot. <laughs> if not, if they don't relist it, then this is the end of the road and Fort Worth's property is secure. Uh, the diocese's property is secure. Yeah, we've been following uh, court cases, especially in the Episcopal Church, for uh, almost since the Dennis Cannon was passed. Uh, famous was uh, uh, Chuck Murphy's church uh, trying to leave South Carolina. And uh, I look forward to talking to Alan Haley if this goes forward. Um, it's, and it's fun to learn about the law. You know, uh, there, there's so many words that we have to define when talking uh, to you know, the laity about the law because it's convoluted. There's a reason lawyers make so much money. They yeah, and why Alan has an Airstream giant <laughs> aluminum tube and you have what a... Uh, uh, 2004 country star. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> But yeah. Al, Alan is, well, I'll let Alan talk for Alan, but Alan sure. said, you know, this is the sort of thing that the Supreme Court is there for because... Texas and uh, Illinois and South Carolina have come down on the neutral principles, while uh, uh, New York, California, and some other states have come down on the uh, 
principles of deference to authority. So we do have two law, two different ways of viewing the same law, and this is what the Supreme Court is there for. So, but they've kicked it down the can so long the, yeah. that they just may not want to get involved with this. No, it, but if they do, it's a good thing because basically, you have what we have right now is a state lottery zip code for church property cases. If you're in Virginia, you're unlucky. If you're in Illinois or Texas, you're lucky. You're very lucky. So it, it you yeah. know, and that's not really the way the law should work. It should be one law for one for everybody. Absolutely, neutral principle. Uh, we sat down uh, and talked about what we're going to talk about. The only really thing that we can talk about on a Friday is uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. There's been rumors about whether or not he's going to come back after sabbatical. And before we present this, this is just rumorville. This is, you know, um, something that we're hearing off the ground and, and trying to put two and two together because Justin Welby is starting to lose the people around him, George, uh, mm -hmm. before he goes on sabbatical. And it's been a really, really tough year for the Church of England. They're not doing well in the media. They're not doing well as a structure. And they're really letting down the Church of England or the Britain itself. And I'm seeing more reports of people just don't care about the church anymore. Uh, I saw another report that said uh, some 50% of the uh, uh, clergy voted for the Labor Party. Uh, you know, I'm just like... I thought it was 92%. 92, that, I'm sorry if I, I don't have my statistic perfectly right because I've not finished this yet, George. This is the magic sauce. But uh, so 92% of the uh, clergy voted for the, the Labor Party. Who, who was or in charge? Against, or against, against the Conservative Party. Right. So well, Labor, let's just say... Liberal, what, Scottish what, nationalist, whatever. What famous Marxist communist uh, uh, was in charge of the Labor Party? Jeremy Corbyn? Is that who you're speaking of? Yes. Or, uh, <laughs> no, that's enough. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. So I just, you know, it, it's interesting to see the church now versus what it was 10 years ago in struggle, to see what it was like 20 years ago. And when was the heyday for the uh, Church of England then? Probably 60 years ago? No, I think it was under uh, Edward the Confessor, about 1210, I think they reached their peak. <laughs> and it's been, it's been downhill ever it's since. Downhill since then. But, well, okay. So let's talk. Uh, it, it's been rough for Justin. Justin comes from a business background, and uh, he was brought into uh, the fold to be the Archbishop of Canterbury to settle and make peace. I can come and I can make peace between the Orthodox in Anglicanism and the Liberals in Anglicanism, between the Episcopal Church and Africa. I can, I can do that because that's what I do as a middle manager. And it was presented. You and I were on board. We thought, you know, maybe Justin can do it. For two whole years, you and I tried as best we could to look at the positive news coming out of the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury's office and Lambeth and the church house. And we said, yes, 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 Justin, you can do it. And I got to say, for those who said Justin was not the man, I humbly submit to you, you are correct. And uh, let's talk about whether or not he should come back to it. Well, let's, let's sort of paint a bigger picture. Okay. The, the, the hook that Kevin and I are hanging this on is that Justin Welby is going to take a three or four month sabbatical uh, b before the Lambeth Conference in 2022. It might be later this year. I'm not sure the exact dates. And let's just sort of paint a picture. Justin Welby was elected Archbishop, appointed Archbishop of Canterbury in 2013 by the grace and favor of God and the Queen and the Prime Minister. The uh, Justin Welby had only been Bishop of Durham for two years, which is sort of an unusually short period of time uh, to be Bishop before getting kicked upstairs to Canterbury. However, he had a very good, impressive resume. He had not gone immediately into the church after university, but had been an executive at an oil company. And 
part of the buzz around Justin Welby was the management culture of business can help turn the Church of England around. And it's been part of the ethos of the last decade of the Church of England that we're going to be well run, we're going to encourage uh, bishops to have more MBA-like training, uh, and this and that. Now, you're absolutely right. You and I uh, liked Justin Welby when he came in the door. I liked him for theological reasons. Um, but when I heard this stuff about, well, he's a businessman and can bring business sense to the Church of England, I wasn't so sure because he was a finance guy. He wasn't a business guy. He wasn't the guy uh, working with people. He was working with numbers. But hey, you know, whatever. So Welby comes on and he's just had a difficult run. Part of it is any archbishop would have had a difficult run. It sort of, it drained Rowan Williams, who is brilliant and who has a tremendous capacity for hard work. The man could be a full-time archbishop, do his job, plus write books on the side. <laughs> and do a speaking but, tour. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Welby, Welby comes on and in 2013. And last year has been pretty bad in the sense of public relations problems and now COVID. In 2015, Colin Coward, a friend of ours, not necessarily a friend of the show, but at that time, the head of the gay and lesbian Christian movement in England met with Canon David Porter. David Porter is an Anabaptist minister who was brought on by Welby to be his director of reconciliation to sort of lead the conversations between liberals and conservatives. How do we go forward over the issue of gay marriage? In 2015, Canon Porter told Colin Coward, according to Colin Coward, that and, the staff... I, at, I believe Colin in this. Yeah, Colin yeah. doesn't lie. No. Colin doesn't lie. Um, he's an honorable fellow. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the staff at Lambeth Palace was expecting to lose 20% of the Church of England. They described it as, we'll keep the 80% in the center and lose 10% on the margins. Now, maybe 2% on one side, 18% on the other, but what have you. And the reason why is that they are basically going forward, eventually bringing about some form of recognition of gay marriage to sort of bring the church in line with the culture. Whether And how that appears, how that works out, they've still not figured it out. So that David Porter has sort of been kicked upstairs from the Director of Reconciliation to Justin Welby's right-hand man. 2017, Welby brought on board as Bishop of Lambeth, a man named Tim Thornton. Tim Thornton had been Bishop of Truro, and he looks like a bishop. He's youngish, handsome. He had been a suffragan bishop in Sherburn, then Bishop of Truro. Uh, he had the more traditional 20 years in the Episcopacy, 10, 15 years in the Episcopacy than Welby did. He was brought on board to assist Justin Welby at Lambeth Palace. And he's been the point man for the Lambeth Conference. He's been the point man for the abuse things, the abuse issues. And Tim Thornton, who is 63, announced that he's taking early retirement to spend time with his family. Now, in England, you retire when you're 70, when you're a bishop of the Church of England. So he's cutting out seven years early to spend. It's like when a politician says, I want to spend more time with my family. They're just waiting for the pictures to get released. <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> now, he could very well want no, to spend more time with his family. I'm doing I that. Mean, so, Kevin, yeah. you're perfectly happy living in a tin box with your wife with no dividers between the two of you. Oh, good. I want to say ha we are surviving well, Tim has come under a great deal of pressure from the survivors abuse networks, the people who have been pressing the cause for the reform of the Church of England's handling of abusive clergy. And Thornton has been the one that people are accusing of stonewalling because Justin Welby says, I'll meet with abuse survivors five years go by. And, you know, Thornton is the one who's talking to the abuse survivors saying, well, here, is, here are the questions you may ask. Here are the answers Justin Welby's going to give. And here's how we're going to take the pretty picture. So Thornton 
either is the man doing the decisions or is the man enacting the decisions. And he's bailing out. And I don't know whether we can tie it to the recent revelations about the uh, John Roberts case in Liverpool. That was the priest who was uh, in his retirement, worked under Welby at Liverpool Cathedral, was abusing uh, young men. And one of the victims complained to Welby and Welby told him to shut up, go away, don't bother me, kid. So whatever it is, Tim Thornton is bailing out before the Lambeth Conference, and he's been the point man. Mm -hmm. He's bailing out seven years before retirement. you normally would. And then Welby's chaplain, Elizabeth Hamley. Now, friends of ours, friends of the show in England, report that the, this is a bit of a dragon, uh, Elizabeth Hamley, but that was his chaplain. And sometimes people bring aboard assistants whose personality is just like theirs. A bad manager surrounds himself with people just like him, whereas a good manager surrounds himself with people uh, of different backgrounds and persuasions to sort of get a rounded picture. Elizabeth Hamley, his chaplain, who's a bit of a dragon, bit of a piece of work, people tell me. I've never met the woman, so I don't know. And yeah, it's that's, yeah. rude of me to say these things. She's bailed out. Mm -hmm. And they created a, I don't want to say fake job, but they advertised the position of part-time theological advisor to the House of Bishops. But the part-time salary, the full-time salary is 70,000 pounds a year. So a part-time at half-time is 35,000 pounds a year, which is basically 10,000 pounds more than being a parish rector. And they designed, the job description was designed for this person. So she, so she either was kicked to the side, kicked upstairs, but she's been given a six month vacation while she looks for another place to go. Now, David Porter, we don't think is leaving, but you've got all these things sort of coming together. You've got living love and faith which is the Church of England's response so far to normalizing same-sex relations. They're turning up the temperature, uh, boiling the water each year until finally the frog realizes it's been cooked and we have gay marriage. They're expecting to lose 20%. The Church of England this year has lost 20% of the people because of COVID. And Lambeth 2022 doesn't look like it's going to repair the damage that happened in 2010. We still have the GAFCON boycott. Um, Welby has, if anything, further alienated himself from the uh, key primates, Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda. So I, 65, I think we're going to see some sort of graceful announcement before the Lambeth Conference, because he'll want to preside over that. Sure. And he'll sort of be the, <clears throat> you won't want to be mean to Welby because he's leaving, and therefore anything you say has no meaning if you criticize his policies. I think the cards are being laid out. Either he's reorganizing and hunkering down and getting ready for the Russians to storm the bunker, and he's going to be there till the very end, or we're seeing the we're seeing in the in the bureaucratic world in the corporate world all the little pieces and signs of a uh, change they're in the offing an extended vacation key staffers leaving major projects that were the showpieces of his tenure falling apart around him what's that telling you it's interesting because we did have a lot of support for you, between you and I uh, for just well being the first two years, and then he started to choose sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. I, I, I can hold this together. I can make this work. I can join the liberals and conservatives, and we can move forward as a church. And even at that time, he says, even as a church, that's twenty percent less. If we lose twenty percent of the communion like this, that's fine. I understand that. We'll do it together. Then at some point, uh, two two and a half years into his uh, reign. I use that loosely, of course. He chose sides. He says, I'm siding with the liberals. I don't know why he chose sides. Clearly, they have the money. Uh, they have property. They have uh, 
the politics of the day. They don't have to fight the culture. They are the culture. And so he chose sides. And in doing so, he lost my support, clearly George's support. Uh, GAFCON stopped trying to work with him. And he, he lost support in Africa, except for those countries who really needed the money. And so here we are today with uh, Archbishop Justin Welby. Where do we go forward from here? I say he stays in office just to spite you and me. You know, who knows? But I think you're right when we discussed this before that things are kind of lining up where he's not going to have the inter Lambeth support. And he may be setting up for an announcement right before Lambeth that this is his final Lambeth and that they'll be looking for a successor, a successor to Archbishop Justin Welby. We'll have to see. I mean, you, but you and I have prognosticated like this before on topics. And lo and behold, accidentally, we, we always seem to pick the right cards and we're right. I don't we, know why. We picked Catherine Jeffrey Shorey as the next presiding bishop at the Columbus General Convention. Sure. We picked Justin Welby as the next Archbishop of Canterbury. And we didn't get be Michael cool. Curry, though. Michael Curry, we, we did thought... get Michael Curry. Yeah, we uh, blew I... that one. <laughs> but, uh, but the, well, two out of three is bad. You know, uh, if you want to talk about, you know, Justin Welby is, in practice, a Catherine Jeffrey Shorey as far as the short tenure before Archbishopship. She was a, a bishop for like a weekend, and then she became presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He was bishop of, of uh, Durham for two years before he became Archbishop of Canterbury. There seems to be this way, we found our guy, get him to the top. We found uh, the right person, move them on up. Well, the, in a uh, normal political environment, Welby's problems would give heart to his opposition. Mm -hmm which in Welby's case are the liberals and the conservatives. It's the corporatists who back Welby. I'm not very optimistic because the conservatives in England are actually madder at each other than they are at the liberals or the corporatists. This is true. They are fighting each other the, the, tooth and nail. The, tra the traditional battles between the evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics are now intensifying and getting nastier and personal. And the inter-evangelical political war is getting personal and nastier. And it's part of it is that the cause is the Jonathan Fletcher issue. Mm -hmm. And all of the things that reverberate around that. We printed a press release the other day from the Church Society, where the Church Society said it would... Church Society is, if you will, the main uh, rallying point for traditionalists against the, in the Church of England, in the institution. Who are still inside the Church of England? Inside the Church, they uh, they was, they said we're going to appoint an external uh, investigator to look at accusations or a bullying culture, and that we have problems with anti-Semitism. And I read this, and I knew exactly what they were coming from and where they're talking about. And I don't mean to be dismissive of anybody, but the anti-Semitism part arose when some Jewish bloggers and Jewish Christians complained about. Uh, the influence of Stephen Sizer, uh, former rector of Virginia Waters, within the Church Society. Now, Kevin and I have met Stephen. He's a charming fellow. He's a lovely guy. We've we've eaten meals with him. Well, the last meal was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he is out there on the Palestinian-Israel issue. He has and one. He has one issue. This is, yeah. I don't mean to be unkind to Stephen, because I do like him as a yeah. person. And his theologically is on just about every issue is sound, but the Jews. It's like your crazy uncle that you only see at weddings and funerals, and you try to get away from him uh, when he starts talking about Freemasons. Stephen Sizer has appeared on stages with uh, Iranian mullahs and Hamas, and he's been disciplined by his bishop for after complaints from the Jew Board of Jeopardies of British Jews for anti-Semitism. And I think within England, the church society is not anti-Semitic. They just, this is one of their guys, and they sort of are like George and Kevin. Yeah, 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 we know all about Stephen, but just, you know, just so as so long as he doesn't bring it up in front of us, we're not going to worry about it. Well, in this day and age, in the social media world, there are no... Uh, <laughs> 
you there's can't no say corners. this is forbidden territory. Yeah, I mean, there's no corner you can hide in in this social media age. Uh, if you have an opinion and you express it, and somebody doesn't like it, a lot of people are going are going to know about that. Yeah. So, so, so this anti-Semitism thing is. Uh, I don't want to be dismissive of it because anti-Semitism is a tremendous problem, mm -hmm. but it's not a problem in conservative circles. It's a problem in PC and woke circles. The, is, the Jew haters of today are not uh, rednecks with Confederate flags. They're, They're educated in university common rooms. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Yale, the Harvards, the Princeton. I know exactly who are the uh, anti-Semitics it's Hollywood now. It's uh, uh, the influence of Islam in our culture. It, it, it is amazing to see how this nation, uh, who was there at the beginning to support the new nation of Israel uh, many, many decades ago, is now uh, fighting it tooth and nail. I'm like, how did this change? So. It is funny because within American culture, it was the liberals who were pro-Israel yeah. up until and the conservatives were distrustful now uh one of the mantras of american conservative politics is the is support for israel that's why donald trump uh was is the most pro-israel president the united states has ever had and i think the orthodox jewish vote went something like 94 percent for donald trump at the last election mm -hmm. you can't do any better than that um, but but and the other issue is one that they encourage a bullying culture, and specifically this is the Andreev case where um, lead, where the rector of a parish that is under the patronage of the church society, uh, with basically they're accused of bullying and trying to make this thing go away, and this is. I have sympathy for both sides. You and I have been in contact with the, the rector and his wife, and they're lovely, decent people. We know the people involved. I've spoken to Lee Gatiss uh, about this, and I see no malice or whatever. I just think this is one of those things that when a church turns on itself, there are no winners. But so but I, I raise all this up because this is all tied into the Jonathan Fletcher and bullying and the old boy network versus outsiders and the anger and the pens, friend up press, pent up frustration of people are boiling over. I say once so, a year. So, the, so yeah. the net effect is that there's not going to be a single person around whom traditionalists will coalesce. Yeah. For the last 10 years, about once a year, we have an episode that tends to uh, pontificate the the end of the Church of England. I, you and I have talked about it. Gavin and I have talked about it. Gavin, you and I have talked about it. And there's nothing I've seen that has changed that trajectory. It seems to be on, on the trajectory of, of falling apart and not being able to continue at some point. Uh, and I'm not speaking highly of uh, GAFCON in the UK and, and all it's doing. Uh, the AMIE they got that right uh, may not be doing really well or may not be the best program going but they may be the only thing left in five years after the collapse of the Church of England and I think you know there, there's hope in that you know that there is there are other alternatives but you and I've talked about this before there's nothing that seems to be turning the course of the Church of England and we thought maybe years ago Justin Welby was that course turner um, it seems not and we shall have to see what happens in the future the conservatives are still fighting the liberals are watching the conservatives fight um, and enjoying it and because uh, they do if if the conservatives just fight each other the liberals aren't losing they're winning and but I do see a one little ray of sunshine uh, and that's technology uh, one of the things I've found in my little parish here in Hooterville, Florida, is I have people from England watching some of my watching my worship services, and they write, and we raise their prayer concerns uh, within our congregation and on the the, the the 
the morning and evening prayer services and the Sunday services we broadcast. And it's some people have found a virtual community to replace the community of their church, which is shut down, or the the rector is so crazy that you know they can't stand going back. And the nearest good place to go is a hundred miles away. It's not ideal by any means, but I think in this period, uh, in this beginning of the Dark Ages, we we have the tool to be able to connect with one another and to pray for one another and to affirm and lift up one another. Uh, that is unique to our time, and I think that's how the church universal the 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 church that is known to god is going to survive and prosper during these days the church institutional is not going to do well no it, it, it it's new times it's COVID times we'll just have to to see what's happening i don't have anything else on my note sheet george we've covered everything i can think of um uh, indian corruption <laughs> that's as, <laughs> right now the topic of the day is Church of England corruption but uh, yeah Indian corruption um, let's see we had lots of good comments on last week's show uh, a, a, some people thought you know I was a, a, a little presumptuous in, in saying that the, the only solution out of this is unity I didn't say it would be easy okay I just said persecution should be something that draws us together uh, and so Somehow somebody made a comment on gun control. Whatever. Hey, <laughs> not a big deal. But keep uh, the channel going in the comment section. We do appreciate you guys going there. We read every comment. We comment every comment. Sometimes my comments may be a little more satirical, but that's fine. I, can I ask? Sure. Can I, I ask uh, our viewers to pray for Justin Bobby? Mm, absolutely. Um, I'm conscious of, uh, well, I say bad mouthing. The man because he's disappointed me as we've enumerated for several years now but he is a man after all who was a man you know with human strengths and weaknesses who i don't believe is you know when we talk we have to sort of distinguish when we talk about some of these indian bishops these guys are real crooks with no conscience i mean they just they're horrible people who are no, oh, risen some, to the top okay, but hold on some 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 okay. of them are They're horrible like, people yeah. who have used the church to advance themselves financially. It's a, it's a means to power. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby's not sought to enrich himself. Justin Welby's not sought to do any of these things. He is a man who I believe is misguided in the avenue of that he's chosen, but his intentions are good and honorable and decent. <laughs> and I just pray that the Lord give him patience and strength and courage and to lead him in the right paths i'm not going to presume to tell him what the right paths are i'm happy to tell <laughs> that's 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 part of my broken and sinfulness that i think i know the answers no but i do, well, what i do but i do know the answer it's repentance and come to jesus christ absolutely i mean even even if you've got a plastic collar around your neck he wears his like this which is another thing that i it's the Dilbert, okay? Yeah. That's uh, ju that's Justin Dilbert, Dilbert tie. But but we really need to pray for him and our leaders, mm -hmm. so that you know God's will is worked out through their lives. Yeah. Uh, pray for all the primates, absolutely. Yeah, and that's one of the things. The solution to the problem in the Anglican Communion has been there the whole time. That's repentance. That's turning around from your your wicked ways. And returning to the Lord. I mean, it, it's been there since the Gene Robinson, since before Gene Robinson. Uh, you, you go through all the, the things that have split this church um, where we just sought ourselves in the church and not sought Christ in the church. And the solution has been there the whole time. Uh, and let me be honest here. The conservatives and the Orthodox aren't always the first to, to see the solution as well sometimes that solution is very difficult to see uh, repentance within the church both sides need to repent oh but we're right yeah I know you're right okay I, I, I got it I got it you're right <laughs> to achieve the rightness you must repent <sighs> oh. we'll talk theology some other time 
And but Kevin, yeah. uh, I've had fourteen uh, skin cancer surgeries over the last two years, oh, and I look at my clock, and I've got the fifteenth in a half hour. <laughs> oh, <there you> so, <laughs> Ooh, slice and dice. <laughs> oh my! Well, I, I certainly have paid for somebody's powerboat over the years. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Let's look at the guy who's we're having some upgrades done to the RV. While we're when we're in Florida, I call it dry dock. We're, we're mm. at one place. We've been here for about two months. We're um, just taking a break from all the massive travels. We did uh, fifteen thousand miles in the RV last year. A lot of fun. However, we needed to take a break and get some things fixed up. So we got an endless water heater installed. So when we turn on the water and we're hooked up to the hose outside, it's always hot if we want it hot. We got a new convection microwave installed and we're getting some other things. But darn it all, if I did not see my RV tech on the website looking at boats. <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. I, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> and I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 647 of Anglican Unscripted.